Okay, let's get this conference going. I'm pleased to welcome on stage Ari on Bjornsson from Epic to kick us off with their Unreal 5 Insights. Over to you, Ari. So I have a few extra minutes. It's quite a few of you. So there was originally supposed to be me and another evangelist coming here to do talks. But Aaron, my um, UK evangelist, he unfortunately got sick last minute. So uh, he had to cancel. So it's only going to be me also at uh, 5 o'clock during, during the talk. But I would absolutely love it if we could all say together, hi from Sheffield, and I'll do a selfie, Cam. I'll send it to him to like, you know, Greetings, uh, wishes. So first, let's practice it. I'll say three, two, one, and then we'll all go hi from Sheffield. Okay, let's practice. Three, two, one. Hi from Sheffield. Oh, that was very loud, very nice. I could hear you all very clear. I want this even, even louder if you can. Let's put it in video mode. Okay, oh my God, there's many of us. Are you ready? I'll pan over, don't worry, I'll get all of you. So. Three, two, one. Excellent, thank you so much. It's a great icebreaker, I think. So I'm super honored, super happy, super excited to be able to do a keynote in front of this audience. Um, this is actually the biggest live audience I've ever had. So, yay. <laughs> And I've actually been dying all day because the first slide is just, I'm going to go immediately into my number one favorite topic. And I'm so excited to tell you all more about me. <laughs> so hi, everyone. I am Ari Arnbjörnsson. You don't have to say my last name. We don't say that much in Iceland. We just say Ari. We call even the president with like Mr. First Name. I am an unrelenting evangelist at Epic Games. So um, people often ask me, what does an evangelist do? Well, I'm the first point of contact for indies and smaller studios that um, want to know anything about Unreal Engine, Epic Games, store, grants, whatever. So I put my email there, but don't email me because you're way too big of a studio for me. You actually have a business uh, development manager, so just you know, go up the chain and you'll get like you get the the premium kind of. Um, Treatment. I'm there for the non-premium. <laughs> I'm the cheap one, so I'm free actually. But I don't know if you have something like um, if you have a specific question. I'm a programmer by trade, so uh, I'm just going up and down the slide. I'm a game programmer. Actually, the last thing I did before joining Epic Games, just a bit over a year ago, was as a lead programmer on Returnal. So, uh, did anyone play Returnal? Let me hear some noise. There's dozens of us. <laughs> I'm, I'm super proud of that game, it did really well. So uh, I also focus on Northern Europe, so that, that's mostly um, the Nordics and the Baltics. There's another evangelist who was supposed to be here with me, Aaron, who is like in your region, but like I said, um, I'll send him the video and I'll go like, yeah, yeah, to him. I've been 15 years in game dev, and uh, actually this one is not just for the indies, this is also for you. I put all my um, tips and tricks, I have over 200 tips and tricks, I put my personal notes on my website, art.games, and I decided to just make them public. And uh, also most of my presentations, uh, this one is actually already there, sorry about that, if you thought you were getting something special, but it's not. <laughs> and yeah, that's it. I'm going to start this already by, what's the next slide? I don't know. Let's just see. I think it's a video. Yeah.
Whoa. Unreal Engine 5. Um, this was super exciting back before we released, but now it's just like, yeah, we've seen it. We were using it already. But OK, so the key features we were going for with Unreal Engine 5 was like, this is next gen. This is a generational leap in fidelity. Uh, and we want everything to be real time. That means fast iteration for everyone on the team, artists, designers, and programmers. And yeah, we wanted tools that are empowering teams of all sizes to make bigger games. And I will touch on that in the slides. By the way, like I feel very sorry for the guys who are me because I really like walking around the state. It's really big and just, yeah. So we have three projects you can already check out and download. Um, well, maybe don't download the early access demo because it was made for early access, but it should uh, convert just fine. So you can download that already from the Epic Games launcher. And this is a great example of most of the features talking about today, but I would actually recommend ignoring that and instead of going for the Lyra starter game. So Lyra is, it's a project that, so we had shooter game before that some of you might know of, like, um, it, like that was our old, this is how you should use Unreal, but it wasn't really that much of how you should use the new uh, features. It was made kind of with a lot of the thoughts that went into Unreal Engine 3, like, big C++ classes that everything wasn't really using the components, but we decided with Lyra, we're not gonna do that again, we're gonna do it proper. So all the newest features, everything, we are using it a lot. And um, I think pretty much everything I'm talking about today is in Lyra. I recommend you check it out. It's a really fun project to poke around in and, and yeah, and you can download it right now from the marketplace. But also we have the city sample project. So we had the, um, Matrix Awakens, where we had um, Neo and Trinity going around a big city, and we made the project just free for you to download. You don't get Matrix, uh, you don't get Neo and Trinity. Sorry about that. Do you, but you do get the city, and you do get uh, the metahuman character that was with them, and all the AI for the um, cars and the people there. And we we've been getting some. Like well, even when we were in early access, we were seeing the community doing, the community doing some amazing things with the engine. And I want to show you a quick video with all the cool things they did before we even released. Also, I hope you all got your swag packs, because I usually don't get swag at other conferences, because otherwise my home house would just be full of swag, but this bottle, full glass, super nice. I recommend you get it. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. So let's just, so the rest of this presentation is just going to be the features of Unreal Engine 5. Uh, not all of them, but like anything I could fit in there, anything that's kind of noteworthy. And some of those are not going to be kind of valid for everyone in here, but I try not to spend too much time on each one so that, um, yeah, so I'm trying to cast the widest net. So let's start with Nanite. There's a lot of technical stuff on here uh, for marketing, and I'm just going to ignore that. I'm just going to tell you what I think about it. <laughs> so Nanite is our new mesh streaming technology. 
Usually how you would have to do it before was that you would create a mesh and then you would create all the different LODs. And then when you were loading a map that had all these meshes, you would have to load like all of the meshes and then all the LODs uh, before you could even show anything. And that would take a really long time. So with Nanite, what we're doing is that we have this thing called the fallback mesh. And that is kind of like this coarse, reasonable quality fallback mesh that either if someone doesn't have Nanite, it will um, default to that. And also we use this fallback mesh for physics, for ray tracing and stuff like that. And then what we do is we use the depth buffer as you're looking around and we do the same thing that we do with textures. So with textures, we, we don't load them in with the map, we just stream them in. We, we load the lowest MO, uh, MIP level and then everything else gets streamed and we want the same thing for um, meshes. So that, yeah, uh, Unreal Engine looks at the depth buffer, see what meshes are close to the camera, see, sees which side of them are. So we're not even, like we're chunking every single mesh into multiple bytes and then eluding those. So that, yeah, you look at a rock and it will only load the side of the rock in higher detail that you're actually looking at. And it works really well. Uh, we got this already working like there. This is all of this being streamed in. And uh, here it's currently supported only on next gen. So PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, and kind of newest uh, graphics cards. And we decided, you know what? This is going to be a generational leap. This is like when people introduced polygons. You needed special hardware, it wasn't supported anywhere, but now polygons are everywhere. So we want this, we're just saying, sorry, this does, doesn't run on all tech, it doesn't run on phones, it runs on next gen only. And, uh, but we're hoping this is gonna be the new foundation of how we do graphics from now on. So you have to, you do have to cut away baggage if you're gonna like move the industry forward. Anything else I wanna say on there? No, that's, oh yeah, and we uh, acquired Rad Game Tools and we got Oodle from them and uh, we just decided, let's just compress everything we can with Oodle. This is what PlayStation 5, uh, Oodle Kraken, they're using that with a hardware decompression. And then, can't talk about Nana without talking about Lumen. So Lumen is our new global illumination, uh, dynamic global illum illumination, and when I say this, some of you are gonna be like, what does that even mean? So global illumination is when you have light hitting a surface and then it bounces and the secondary light lights up other surfaces. So you have a dark room, one window, light comes in and it kind of lights up the whole room even though it's only hitting a small surface. Dynamic lighting doesn't support this. It, it will have a single ray of light and it will hit there and nothing else lights up. So. Previously, if you wanted this, you would either have to go with um, pre-baked lighting, which was very time consuming and took space on your hard drive and, uh, with the game when you shipped it, or you'd have to use um, dynamic global illumination uh, by th via third parties, but those didn't even, like those would still bake in light probes and you couldn't move too much. Um, we couldn't use, for example, when I was working on Returnal, we couldn't use any of those solutions because um, the levels are procedurally generated. So couldn't use any of the solutions they used, uh, baked probes. Let me see. Uh, 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 uh. It supports both ray tracing and without ray tracing. We uh, use the SDFs when you turn off the ray tracing, but, without, but with it, then we use the fallback mesh for the BVH to get a little bit overly technical. Uh, 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 what else do I want to talk about? Nothing, next. So. Temporal super resolution. Oh yes, actually that is something I wanted to talk about in Lumen. Currently we're only able to run it at 30 frames per second on a 1080p back buffer. Like I don't wanna be the snake oil salesman that says use Lumen for everything. Like no, it is currently very expensive because it's doing a lot of things. It's like fully dynamic. We've never seen this before. Um, so yes, it's like using a lot of different text, like uh, screen space, ray tracing, everything to, uh, and also it's temporal, meaning that you get infinite bounces, but just spread over multiple frames. So it is currently, like I said, running on 30 frames per second, 1080p back buffer, but, and this is something that isn't in this slide because someone asked me, are you gonna tell us something new? Yes, we are working currently on 60 frames per second because that is now our number one top priority this year. And so Lumen, 60 frames per second, still with the 1080p back buffer should be out this year and instead of we call it, instead of being epic quality, it's just high quality. So it's gonna have some, it's gonna look a little bit different because it doesn't have as many rays and stuff like that. But yeah, you're gonna get it at 60 frames per second. 
And then you might think, well, 1080p back buffer, that not, that's not very high resolution. Well, actually, so we have this thing called temporal super resolution, and that is our new anti-aliasing technology, but it's so good that we actually decided to call it an upscaling technology. And um, so this is a horrible image because, like, you can't really see what's happening. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, what we're able to do with this is that you're able to take a 1080p back, uh, buffer and scale it up to 4K, and it should look really, really good. Um, to make an example, because it's the only, like, Unreal game I worked on was Unreal, uh, was um, Returnal, so I'll keep mentioning that. But Returnal also shipped with a uh, 1080p back buffer. And then we used, uh, not even this one, we used the previous one, previous generation, to scale it up and then uh, to 40, 40, and then we used checkerboard to get it up to 4K. And people didn't seem to mind. Uh, we got actually quite a few tech awards and graphics, so you're able to get quite far with uh, lower back buffers. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm not going to use Lumen because then we can't go native 4K, I would say you'd be a fool to try to go for native 4K if you can get quadruple um, milliseconds to use per, like um, by not going 4K and then instead just upscaling it. This is actually kind of neat, virtual shadow maps. So the old cascading shadow maps would always run every single frame and uh, kind of like render everything. With virtual shadow maps, we're trying to do it so that they only update if they need to, and only parts of it. So uh, this image here, what you can see, is that we've split the shadow map down into tiles. So the closest ones, uh, all of these are 128 by 128 in memory. I think you can even configure that. Uh, they're about like one meter by one meter. They take just as much memory as the tile further away, which is like one kilometer by one kilometer because you know, you're basically LOD'ing the shadows. And we only refresh them, redraw them when needed. So if something moves in them, then we invalidate them and then we'll be drawn next frame. Or if the camera is moving uh, closer and further away, then we'll like keep LOD'ing it. But, um, but yeah, so then once we're done drawing it, we'll just keep it in memory. Right now, it's a bit of a, like yay and nay, because in many ways it's faster and much better looking, but in some ways it's still slower than the normal cascading star maps. So um, tweak it as much as you can. Also figure out if this is something that you even want to use, because I, I think we're, we're gonna we're gonna keep working on this. This is supposed to be like amazing next gen tech, uh, supposed to work for everything. But right now, sometimes you might still get better performance with the cascading star maps, even though it doesn't maybe look as good. And then with some um, screen space approximations uh, to make it look better. But because for the virtual shadow maps, we keep, you know, resizing the tiles, you can zoom in, like, I'm not gonna say indefinitely, but very, very close, and still get realistic shadows. So you don't even need these um, ambient occlusion screen space stuff. You just, because the shadow maps just, just keep growing. Anything else, anything else? No, I think that's it, okay. World building, this has been a long time coming, and I just just want to say sorry for anyone who has used Unreal Engine for, um, to make big worlds with big teams, but uh, we, like, we finally made it much better. We introduced one file per actor, which means that anyone can now be working in the same map because there's no map file per se anymore. There's a map file, but it only contains the um, data layers which we're moving out of it anyways, and uh, the um, level blueprints. So now every single actor in the map is its own file. Um, how we used to do it is that we would have one layer, a sub, sub level for the lights, we would have a sub level for the audio or for the design, and then even then only one designer, one audio person could uh, work at it at a time. And yeah, no more. But if you do want, um, do we have the data layers there? Yeah, well, I'll go first into world partition. So, and now we have world partition, which is the new thing instead of world composition, which was the old thing. Uh, as you can see there, you can you have a minimap 
of the world, which you can uh, update it with a commandlet. And you can also, you can use that texture in the game itself also if you want to use it. And uh, the commandlet, I actually looked at it recently to help a studio, and it's super customizable. You can um, overwrite the pre-init function, and you can turn on and off some specific data layers if you want to do like really cool things with the minimap. So uh, yeah, in the editor, you can select which cells you want to work on and load them in. So you don't load in everything, and it takes 20 minutes or more to uh, open the editor, which I know of one AAA studio that took almost an hour to open the editor into your main map. <coughs> so now just yeah, open the level, choose the tiles that you want to work on. And uh, if you want something that had similar functionality as sublevels, we have data layers now. Data layers is, for example, let's say you have a level, and you want to add let's say, snowman for Christmas theme and, and other stuff like that. So you put them in the level and you put them all into the Christmas 2022 data layer. So now the data layer, uh, you can turn it on and off to sh show those snowmen in the, in the uh, editor, but also on runtime, you can uh, choose whether to uh, show them or not. But the thing is, if you decide not to even show them, they won't even get loaded. So that's quite cool. You can use data layers to do selective loading of actors for the level. Mm -mm -mm. And when you are r running the game, so in the editor, it's manual, which um, tiles you load and which you unload. And we are, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to even have it automatic, so you don't even have to do that. Because at runtime, once you package your game, then we have everything automatic. Like, uh, it will load in the cells as you get close to them, and then you can use a uh, streaming focus object if you want to pass tell somewhere and start loading in, in, in advance. Oh, and then we have level instances. So level instances, uh, that's basically, well, it's called the level instance actor. So that's your, your, uh, our way of putting in a whole sub-level into your level, but it's not a sub-level anymore, it's an instance, which means that you can put a sub-level multiple times at different locations into your level. And this doesn't cause any streaming overhead because at cook time, they actually just get baked into the original level. And those level instances can contain their own level instances and so on and so forth. Of course, it just can't be a circular reference. Um, yeah, and those level instances can have their own one file per actor. Our animation tools, they are still managed to blow my mind with like all the things they have in there. I'm gonna just say some words that I don't even know what are because it goes over my head. So we have, well, okay, scripting and extensibility of the animation editor, so now it's easier for you to make your own tools. Blend spaces 2.0, don't know anything about that, but it sounds cool. Motion warping, that, that, that one actually I do know. So we have an animation that has root motion of a character jumping, but it only jumps about one meter. And um, sorry, I'm speaking. Wait, do you? No, you, you don't use meters. <laughs> and um, you can use the motion warping uh, in the level itself to dra drag around these control points to make um, the animation stretch without like affecting the root motion itself, but still you're stretching out the root motion also. So I guess you are affecting it. So that's really nice. We also have now a full body inverse kinematic solver, finally, and we also use the solver for retargeting. So now you have, uh, actually we, we have some awesome videos on our YouTube that we shared recently from an evangelist called Andreas Sueka, and uh, he is showing how you can use a runtime uh, skeletal IK retargeting to do it between completely different skeletons at runtime. It's really cool, I recommend you check it out. Then we have Control Rig. Um, I have a slide on that next after this, so I'm gonna skip over this for now. But with the Control Rig, you can use Pose Library uh, to save specific poses, and then you can tween between them with our tweening tool. So Control Rig, this is our new in-engine animation. You can use Control Rig to either make fully procedural uh, runtime animations, you can use it to do additive animations to already baked animations from other tools like Maya and Blender or Max. And then lastly, you can use it to create new animations fully inside Unreal Engine. So if you have a mesh and you want to animate it and you have the bones already, you don't even have to go to your um, other tool. You can just do it all in Engine. Let me see. 
One good example of uh, how you can use it is, for example, you can use our, uh, like for example, you can download MetaHuman, uh, you, and you can download our free app called uh, Live Link Face, and then you can have full face motion capture, just out of the box, and you can record it with Live Link, and then when, when you're done recording it, you can use Control Rig to tweak the animations to add more expressions. Yeah, and so with the features, of course, we have the standard, you know, reverse foot placement, you can um, create or change animation engine, which I already mentioned, and debugging, it has some really cool debugging tools that draws into the scene so you can like actually see what's happening and not have to guess. Game features and modular gameplay. So this is something that we made because we needed it for Fortnite. And what this does is that it allows you to create game features as a plugin that depend on the game, but the game itself doesn't depend on them. So the game is actually feature agnostic. So the, uh, the game feature itself will actually basically inject itself into the game. You can have, so th there's uh, some basic things you can do already, like you can uh, create uh, let me see. Yeah, th we have these extensions. You can create new primary assets, uh, new levels, stuff like that. And how by default it works is that you can, for example, create a component on any actor of a certain kind. So you can use, you can create your own game feature plugin that says, uh, for the main character, give them the jump ability. And the game itself didn't even know that it could do that. And then you can also add your own extension points. You can have interfaces so that you can have the plugins themselves call some interface function to register themselves with some system. So it's it's very like um, you can use it in many different ways. Anything else you want to talk about there? No, you. Oh well. And uh, the life cycle. So you can have it like installed, registered, loaded, and active. And this is something you can control both in the editor and at runtime. So. For example, let's say we're making a new feature for Fortnite, and we don't we, we want to keep working on it. We want to be able to test it, but we don't want, for example, it to leak. So we work on it. We make a internal build, and then we only include the plugin in the cook when we're making our internal builds. And then for external, we don't don't even include them, or we do include them just before it's live, and then we only uh, remotely uh, like enable them when it's time to actually like show them. <laughs> Mass AI. If you watched the Matrix Awakens demo, you will uh, you might have seen something about this. So this is our new data-oriented framework, and with that, if you checked out the Matrix Awakens, you, we have like this humongous city, and in the city, every single citizen that is walking around on the streets, every single car, they're always being simulated. Like you can go away from the whole city, and like most of it gets unloaded, but the citizens and the cars are still being simulated with this system. And then when they get closer, that's when you start doing this kind of level of detail of their behavior. So they come closer, and uh, we have like these very simple meshes that have very basic behaviors. And when you get to the distance where you are able to almost run into them, we switch them out with an actor, with a full behavior tree. So they can like now react to you, go like, hello. You can bump into them, and they could go like, the fuck, you know? So, um, and then once they walk away again, we can just put them back into the system, into Mass AI. So you can kind of like exchange both ways. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Audio. So we have MetaSounds. Uh, that's new. And in MetaSounds, it's basically like a material graph, but for audio. So um, you can use it to go wild. You can create fully procedural um, songs. Um, what else? You can like change the audio with all these filters like here. Um, oh, and also one cool thing about it is that because it's its own material graph-ish, it works on the samples, but not in the frame time. So for example, let's say we have, well, here's a wave player, and this may be a bad example, but um, when it has these events to, that you can hook into it to either go, go, uh, do the next audio thing, or you can report back to Blueprint Land. So for example, unfinished, you could say like, oh, this, the audio is done now. So if you're waiting for this audio, you could like, you know, move the character again. But we also have this thing called unnearly finished, which is a funny name. But what it does is that it is telling you the sample 
This is now the last sample that we're playing for this audio player. So we can set up the next sample, like next audio thing, whatever you're doing, and it will just be seamless, even though a lot of them are happening in like what you would call subframe stepping, because these are frame independent. These only run on audio samples. Really powerful stuff. So we have other features, uh, Quartz, that's our, uh, it's really good for making interactive music. It uses, it's called a metronome, metrodome, I don't know, I can't remember. Um, so with that also uh, frame independent, but it fires events into, you know, C++ Blueprint land. And that would be great, for example, to making your own Guitar Hero clone. So, you know, then it, it is timings with the music and you're not like counting per frame. Uh, parameter modulation plugin. We also have Synesthesia, which is our powerful new real-time API for audio analysis, which allows you to, you know, make a graph over, you know, the audio waveform. Stream caching and a whole new suite of audio widgets. Quixo, it's not new, but the way we're using it in Unreal Engine 5 is. So in Quixo, this is actually, I made these slides quite a few weeks ago, if not months, and we've probably gone over 16,000, but when I made this, 16,000 assets that are scanned from real life objects. That means textures, that means meshes. And um, they're already Nanite ready, and we're adding, like I said, all the time. And with Unreal Engine 5, we're actually integrating Bridge, Quixel Bridge, directly into it. So when you have the button there, you might have seen it if you're already using Unreal Engine 5, add content. You can add content either from like uh, your file system, whatever, or from Quixel Bridge. Then you, Quixel Bridge opens up and you log in, and uh, it's, there's no added cost if you're using Unreal Engine. This is like, um, I'm not allowed to use the word free, but it is no added cost for um, any Unreal Engine users because of the royalties, you know, yada, yada. So um, you basically, when you make a new project in Unreal Engine, you have a starter pack for, with 16,000 assets in it. And yeah, you can just open it, and you can drag it and drop it into your scene, even though it hasn't downloaded them yet, it will download them in the background and show you a little preview mesh while it's doing it. It's really cool. And we also have, uh, this is ready for Quixel Mixer. If you don't know, what does anyone know Quixel Mixer? Have anyone used it? Can I see? Uh, yeah, I expected as much. I think this is one of the more, o more overlooked tools that people really should know more of, especially all kinds of artists and tech artists. Uh, what this does is that allows you to mix um, the materials and the meshes from uh, uh, mega scans. For example, you can you can take one of the meshes that you have there, uh, like a vase, a boss, and you can use a what is it called? Mask, a smart mask that masks it depending on the normals. So, for example, you can use it to select all the crevices in the vase and then you put a dirt texture there, and now you just made it so that all the crevices have some dirt in them. And then you can paint on them also. It's really cool. I recommend you check it out. It's free. Uh, yeah. Enhanced input. Uh, I have to kind of like this as a, like an input nerd. So how we used to do input in Unreal Engine 4 is that it was all going through the configs. With Unreal Engine 5, we made it now so that um, it's asset-based, which means that uh, well, it's like kind of easier to set them up, but also if you want to introduce new input bindings as a part of a gameplay feature plugin, you can now just add the assets in there, and once they get loaded, they'll like you know set up the mapping. Also, now we can set up these what we call modifiers per uh, input action, or is it input action or per input? No, per input mapping. Sorry. And here we have like negate to like flip the axis. And then we have like Swiss wool input access. I don't even know what that's for. But probably one of the most common things you're going to be using this for is, for example, the dead zone for the thumbsticks. How we used to do an unrange of forwards was you would have to kind of like add the dead zone modifications handling everywhere you were handling that input. Not anymore. Now you can do it per the binding, and then you get like sanitized um, kind of vectors from it. It also has. Oh well, yeah, radio the dead zones, we have one built in, but you can of course make your own. We have prioritization, so you can have like a menu that consumes the input or lets it through, and then context, like you're in front of a door, now show this action. 
And if you're still on Unreal Engine 4, it was already in there as experimental. This will, to the best of my knowledge, eventually become the default input. So it's not done to start using it already, even if you feel you don't have a huge use for it. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say about that. Next is my number one favorite feature as a programmer in Unreal Engine 5, and that's memory insights. Uh, so this just this is just memory profiling. And how we used to do it is that we had LLM, low-level memory categories, which show you which category would have how much memory. And if you wanted to get kind of like per allocation and stack everything, you would have to use the tools of the platform. So if you were on Windows, you would use, like for example, Windows Profile, no, Windows Performance Analyzer. If you were on Xbox, you would use Pix. If you were on PlayStation, you would use Razer. But now we made it so that you can just use this one because it works on everything except mobile. Sorry about that. Uh, but it works on both the consoles. I, does it work on Switch also? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm not going to promise it. It might work on Switch. And, uh, but yeah, it doesn't work on mobile yet. So, and with this, you can, well, actually, I really like the in investigation, the filtering. Um, I'm going to do a presentation uh, later this year on Inside Unreal, where I'm going to show you how to actually use these tools to find the memory leak. But you can, uh, so here, there's a rule that I'm saying, show me growth, show me every allocation between A and B. But like the filters we have is A, B, C, D. You can say, give me every single memory allocation that happened after A, but before B, and that was deallocated after C, but before D. It's super powerful, and uh, you get the full stack for every single memory allocation. Oh my God, I'm just, I'm so excited. And uh, many of you are just gonna go like, what is he talking about? I'm sorry, but this is just awesome tool. What else on um, there? No, yeah, that's good. Usually when people are upgrading from Unreal Engine 4 to 5, I will tell them, just do it. Because if you don't want to use the new features, you don't have to. Otherwise, it's still Unreal Engine 4, just with some new features on top of it. But one thing that I'm kind of like wrong on is that Chaos is now the default physics engine. We used to have PhysX. Uh, so if you are upgrading from Unreal Engine 4 to 5, this is going to be the biggest difference. No more physics. Now it's the chaos. You sh we still have, if you're compiling your own um, editor, you can still get physics if you really, really want. But I don't know how long we'll keep that support because physics doesn't support doubles. And uh, actually, I don't have a slide for it. But one of the features also we have is large world coordinates. Did I talk about it? No, I didn't. So large world coordinates is something we put already in uh, 5.0. Uh, and it only works with some systems, but we just decided like we, we have to start somewhere. So that replaces all locations from floats to doubles. And that means no longer will you be bound to make um, levels that are only a few uh, square kilometers measured, measured in like, I don't know, I think 20 square kilometers was the biggest thing you could make. Now you'll be able to make a level that is about the size of a solar system. I'm not going to say galaxy, because that's a little bit too big, but maybe a solar system is big enough for most users. So that's another reason also why we wanted to do chaos, because that has uh, this that will have built-in support for large world coordinates out of the box. I don't know if we have it yet, but like we have still some systems catching up. Um, we already, by the way, converted uh, Fortnite to Unreal Engine 5. We're not using um, Lumen and Nanite yet, but we wanted to show you that, hey, you can upgrade to it even if you're not using the new features and for most projects, it should just work. So um, yeah, it has a lot of the things you would expect from a physics machine. So you know, you have rigid body dynamics, animation nodes, uh, cloth physics, destruction, ractal physics, vehicles, physics fields, which is like there you can make physics go in whichever direction during those fields and deep, uh, oh yeah, and fluid and hair simulation, and also deep Unreal Engine system integrations in, like for example, Niagara. So you can just, because in Niagara, everything is data. You can just send them like, hey, here's a physics field. This is how big it is. And now Niagara particles can start using that also. Um, and yeah, replace the legacy physics system. We say significant improvements in performance. That's like for many cases. There are still some cases where it's not fast, and I'm not gonna claim it's currently better than physics in every single way, 
but it's our target to make it better than physics in every single way. We'll keep working on it, this is new. Um, yeah. So turnkey for the continuous integration and the IT crowd. So this allows you basically one click process to set up SDKs. So let's say that you're creating a game and you're making it for um, Xbox series and PlayStation 5. And uh, so you'll get a drop down in your platforms where you would usually cook or build the game. And if you have the SDK and it's up to date, it will show you like the icon for the platform. If it isn't, it will show you a little exclamation icon. And then instead of going like, hey, which SDK? Oh, you have to go to DevNet, like, oh, I don't I need credentials. Oh, it's, we have an offline installer, whatever. Just one click installation now. And also, because this is just using scripts that you set up yourself, of course, you would have to self-host the SDKs because we're not allowed to just go and grab, you know, these very ND8 SDKs. Uh, you can host them on your shared NAS drive or even check them into the project's uh, Perforce or whatever system you're using. Um, but yeah, and also, yeah, like I was saying, because it's script-based, you can also run it as a commandlet. For example, let's say you're setting up a new continuous integration machine. You can just have it automatically set up the SDKs. Quite neat. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can do other things like flash dev kits and stuff. Mm. Okay. And we have a completely, how am I doing on time? Really well. Completely new UI, refreshed experience. So we now have dark theme for, uh, by default. And some people might already know that the, um, this is just a material, like literally the same material that you create for textures. So you can actually go into the project settings and you can change the material to be rainbow colored if you really, really want uh, to give someone nightmares when they look at your screen. Uh, we redesigned the icons and we've also made them use scalable vector graphics so that uh, they will automatically get rasterized on demand. So it doesn't matter how high DPI screen you have, it will always be sharp and nice. And we've made it so that we try to get out of your way. So for this screenshot, I, I made it like the half size of my desktop to fit, fit it in there. But you can see even the half size of my screen, there's plenty of space. We focused a lot here on the, like where the level designers are gonna be uh, spending their time. And then everything else kind of like stays out of your way. We have the content drawer now that is docked by default and to make it pop up, you just press control space and just comes up. You drag something out of it and it goes back down. Of course, if you want it to behave the classic way, you can just, um, what's the word, undock it permanently. Mm, yeah. Niagara is our next generation visual effects tool. We use it to create all of the kind of visual effects that you would expect to see uh, in a real-time environment, and it's programmable. So users are no longer constrained by a fixed function simulation. They can write their own behaviors to create visual effects that people have never seen before. This has to be the right way. Oftentimes when people think about real-time visual effects, they actually think about compromises. So often we look to things like high-end computer graphics or film, and we see these techniques that always felt out of reach, that always felt like something that would have taken 20 hours of frame to simulate. The vision for Niagara is that we take a much more aggressive leap towards those types of simulations, except that we're being able to simulate them in real-time performance frame rates. There are other ways that Niagara is used in this demo that are a little bit more unexpected and a little bit more revolutionary. For example, creatures, bats, and ambient bugs skittering through the environment. These are actually very complex Niagara simulations that are built on the back of countless interesting technological innovations. Things like particles directly communicating with each other and understanding their space in the world, solvers and simulators that are actually you know, averaging their positions and creating flocking behaviors, response to stimulus. These are all actually behaviors that come about through the Niagara visual effects tool, and this is kind of revolutionary for effects. 
One of the effects that I really love in this demo is the portal that she walks through at the end. And I love it because of the technology that's playing behind the scenes. We actually have this really complicated fluid solver that is driving this cohesive fluidic motion of the particles as they swirl around this portal. They're reactive to the characters, they're colliding with her and they're reacting to the other particles, they're splashing around. This type of simulation would never have been possible before. So this was, or this is Niagara. I thought our um, technical art director said it better than I could have. So Niagara is the new default particle system in Unreal Engine 5. We have deprecated the old one, but if you have older projects and you're moving them over, we still have these conversion wizards to help you convert them to a Niagara format. And the new Niagara editor, yes, you can create particles now both on CPU and GPU. The GPU ones are super powerful and even allow you to do things like um, fluid physics. They could, like you could see there in the gate in the end, they're slushing around and stuff. Um, in our um, content examples, you might, uh, we have a lot of Niagara um, particle effects, which you can just see how we've done it and uh, copy them around. And well, the next few points is a lot of ways to say the same thing is when it, we're working on the GPU, data is just data. You can send in whatever you want and you can kind of handle it and do whatever you want with it. Like I told you with chaos, you could send in you know, the physics fields or whatever and then make the particles do something based on that. You can send in whatever you want. You can even send in, you can probably use the, oh, now I'm just guessing, now I'm speculating. What could you do with that? You could probably use the synesthesia plugin to send in the audio waveform and make the particles do something cool with that. It's just data. And then we have better tools for debugging, visualization, and performance. We, uh, we always keep trying to make our debugging tools better. So even though there are other editors that may, might do the same thing in some uh, instances, we are hoping that our debugging tools are gonna be amazing. Actually, here's a little thing that isn't on the slides, because I'm talking about debugging. Um, we have this experimental plugin for motion matching in Unreal Engine 5. And um, I, when we were like, I've been, a part of teams that have been researching some motion matching, but it was always very hard to see exactly what was going on, why we were choosing some different kinds of animations. But with the motion matching plugin on Unreal, the debugging tools allow you to see every single time it changes an animation and why, and like based on what factors. It's really cool. I could be one of many. <laughs> Je pourrais être architecte ou guide. Qui fait un artiste? You create the narrative. I am metahuman. not coming soon, it's already out. <laughs> Had to skip the slide there. So what do we have here? Okay, yeah, so with MetaHuman Creator, we basically wanted to give anyone using Unreal Engine the ability to create photorealistic humans for their game or even like uh, other type of projects. We um, teamed up with Three Lateral and Cupid Motion, I think they're called. And uh, they're basically creating this team, uh, these tools for us. You might have seen their work in other games like Senua Sacrifice 1, and uh, maybe even two. I'm not gonna guess, that's horrible. That's get, that usually gets me in trouble. And uh, we actually have this new thing in um, MetaHuman Creator, which we just announced and I didn't have time to put in my slide, is that we have this MetaHuman plugin, which allows you to put a 3D scan of any person you want and put it into Unreal Engine, and it will create the shape 
and upload it to MetaHuman for you to keep working on it. Just notice that it's only for the shape of the head and not the textures and not the grooms. That you still need to go through um, create from scratch in MetaHuman itself. But the shape, which is amazing. So how it works is that it will create, um, it will select the base MetaHuman that is the closest to your shape and then we'll add the offsets to it. So the shapes can get quite like weird, but we're still not in the in a place where we can make it for really stylized characters like aliens and stuff like that. But um, I don't know if they're very humanoid, sure. Uh, oh, we have here cubic motion. Yeah, that's what they're called. What else? This is also for no extra cost. I said not free. Um, and yeah, like I said also before, like I've tried it out. I created a meta Ari and uh, I used the free app that is called um, Live Link Face, and you, it's just really awesome the things you can do with it. And we're keep we're going to keep making these tools better because Live Link Face now already works on iOS, but we're working on a version that only works for uh, that o o also works for Android. Um, but otherwise. This was my last slide, and I'm exactly on time, on the minute. I would say email me if you're using Unreal Engine for your project, but you're already, like, your biz dev person, I think, is Ben Board. You can escalate with him if you really want to talk to me. Or you can just send me an email. It's fine. I'm okay with it. Otherwise, I think we should start heading off to the diamond now. And that's the end of my presentation, and thank you so much. <laughs>